Plantation Slavery and Cherokee Removal in Georgia by Anna Rappaport, Anthony Martin, Josh Blancato, and Samantha Spano. To begin, slaves were known to live in very poor conditions. Their homes often had no beds with only coarse blankets, damp soil floors, and little to no furniture. The smaller the plantation, the worse the accommodations were. Plantations often featured a hierarchy between house slaves and field hands. House slaves were considered higher class, they were often females, skilled artisans like blacksmiths or carpenters, or even fair-skinned. While they were less susceptible to whipping and other forms of punishment, they were more susceptible to rape. Regardless, the separation between the house slaves and the field hands created tension that prevented organized rebellion. Moreover, skilled artisans were often treated better and offered favors in order to create an incentive not to escape. Plantation work was known for its painfully difficult tasks and mind-numbing repetitiveness, not to mention the workday's incredibly taxing sun-up to sundown work schedules, though Sundays were often days of rest. As you would imagine, in the eyes of the law, slaves were often treated much more unfairly. Slaves found guilty of arson, rape, or even conspiracy to overthrow their masters were often sentenced to death. Even the education of slaves was a punishable offense. Overseers were workers for the plantation hired for the purpose of getting the maximum work out of slaves. The larger the plantation, the harsher the overseer. Slave drivers were other slaves that were tasked with the same job as an overseer, often given a whip as a sign of authority, and these drivers served to create further tension between slaves, thereby decreasing the chances of organized resistance. Slave codes were laws passed by each state that dictated the acceptable treatment of slaves. The uses of gang labor served to further divide slaves as groups were separated from each other and tasked with different jobs. This simultaneously increased labor efficiency and decreased slaves' ability to organize. In Georgia and other southern plantations, slaves of different skill sets were hired in order to accomplish the various tasks on the plantation. During Jefferson's administration, Benjamin Hawkins first conducted the idea of converting the Native American population through missionary work. In the early 1800s, missionaries from Moravians, Congregationalists, Baptists, and Methodists worked towards converting the Native Americans into not only Christians, but a more advanced white-like civilization through the arts of civilization, which included teaching the Cherokees how to weave, sew, and farm with European techniques. Though not all natives complied, many did. By converting to Christianity and learning the white man's language, many Cherokees thought they could take advantage of the situation. With their submission, they could control trade more effectively, live peacefully with frontier whites, and possibly deter white settlement. Though it's uncommon knowledge, Cherokees had slaves themselves. Before the arrival of Europeans, slaves were taken captive during numerous wars between tribes and treated as prisoners of war. The introduction of African slavery was a result of European interaction with the Cherokee nation through trade, intermarriage, and political relations. One of the major results of African slavery resulted from the effects of the Seven Years' War. During the war, the Cherokees sided with the British forces. As a result of American victory, the Cherokees were left economically and politically weak and seek a source of power. During the late 1700s, after the Seven Years' War, Cherokee elites began the practice of owning slaves as a result of their economical and political devastation. Throughout time, the European practice of Indian slavery and indentured servitude shifted to African slavery. When colonists abandoned Indian slave trade and demanded black slaves instead, Indians became hunters and traders for Africans. The African slave trade was a Cherokee source of power, and until slavery was abolished, 8% of Cherokee own slaves. To own slaves became both a source of wealth and a source of respect, and only those who were elites delved into this power. Though slavery was present, it is important to note that the culture did not embrace chattel slavery, but rather made slavery as their source of wealth and respect by white society. Since Native Americans and white settlers have interacted with one another, there has been conflict. This was especially true in Georgia where they fought over ownership of land, the abundant gold deposits, and the rich soil which led to healthy cotton harvests. These tensions increased with the election of President Andrew Jackson in 1828. His first priority was the immediate removal of all eastern tribes. His plan was put into action in 1830 when Congress passed the Indian Removal Act, which allowed for removal treaties. Following this act came a clash between states' rights and federal imperatives. White Americans and Native Americans fought over treaties, land ownership, and the meaning of sovereignty, as many of the tribes had been declared as sovereign nations. Ultimately, all of the Native Americans were forced to relocate. This was costly for the government and for the natives as well. Expenses for relocation were astronomical. Meanwhile, thousands suffered and died while they traveled west. All of this led to distrust of the government by the American people. As we all know, the Trail of Tears was a forced relocation of Native American tribes to reservations in the Midwest, what we now call Oklahoma. Natives from all over the country were forced to leave their homeland and make the treacherous journey. The Georgia Cherokees were relocated between the years of 1838 and 1839, and it is estimated that between 4,000 and 5,000 Cherokees died on the trail. What was recognized as the Hold House in Cherokee Rose is actually known as the Van House. This plantation house's construction was completed in 1804 and originally belonged to Chief James Van. Van was noted to be a short-tempered alcoholic who harshly disciplined his slaves. Just five years after his house was built, Chief Van was murdered. The Van House was inherited by his son, Joseph Van. The Indian Removal Act forced Rich Joe to relocate with his approximately 110 slaves. 
Similar to the diary that is discovered in Cherokee Rose, the Spring Place Diaries provided a first-hand recount of the events which occurred at the Van Plantation. These diary entries were written by Moravian missionaries who had frequent interactions with the slaves. It is noted that the slaves were given freedom to choose their religious slash spiritual identities. While many practiced native rituals, many were also noted to attend church weekly with the missionaries. Margaret Ann Van, wife of Chief Van, was noted for having unusually cordial relationships with the slaves of the plantation. Exemplifying these relationships was Peggy's allowance of the baptism of a slave's child in her home. Today, the Van House is a historic site in Georgia and is open to the public for tours. Okay, let's discuss. 